At the time, Jesus answered and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and prudent and have revealed them to babes. Even so, Father, for it seemed good in your sight. All things have been delivered to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, nor does anyone know the Father except the Son, and the one to whom the Son wills to reveal him. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. The ways of the world is very hard. It says that the ways that are not following God are, are hard life. It's a, it's a hard life, but the ways following the Lord are wonderful. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for the way that you work in our lives. We thank you for the Holy Spirit who leads us to the truth. We thank you for the Lord Jesus who redeemed us. We thank you, Lord, that you've given us a place where we can come and worship you and learn from you. Uh, we thank you for the Bible. We thank you for everything, Lord. You're a wonderful God, a wonderful Father, and a great friend. And we really uh, appreciate all the effort that you have on our behalf. As we gather today, Lord, uh, we need you to speak to our hearts and encourage us and uh, sort of uh, just reveal yourself afresh to us, Lord. We, we really want to get it right in our lives. And so we give you our attention. And please, Lord, we know you're here with us. Touch our hearts, Lord, and draw us close to you. We want to follow you, dear Lord Jesus, and take your yoke. Please bless us now. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, friends. Please be seated. Well, we give you a hearty welcome. We're so glad that you've joined us today. We trust that the Lord will have a real blessing for you. Uh, <clears throat> some of our Indian friends are leaving. Uh, some of our college graduates have uh, finished their education, and they're going to return back to India. Uh, Buck, who was with us for some time and started some home groups in his neighborhood, uh, he's leaving along with two or three others that uh, were attending before the pandemic. And uh, they came last night to greet us and said that uh, they were going to come and say goodbye to the church today. And they said uh, they were going to make some food and uh, have a kind of like a little bit of a fellowship time. So uh, I told them uh, not everybody likes food as hot as some Indian folks like it. So uh, kind of like it's sort of like medium. We, we like the flavor, but, uh, you know, we don't, we don't want to breathe fire. So, uh, so they said uh, they'll make it kind of mild so that... Uh, Everybody can enjoy it. Uh, some people like it very bland. We don't want it bland, but we don't want it uh, overdone either. So we hope that they'll, uh, they're probably cooking to the last minute and we'll get here pretty soon. But um, we love all of our students and we pray for them and trust that God will help them to do well in their courses. Uh, they give their time to come here and study and uh, we do everything we can to um, help them when we can. There's very little we can do apart from our prayers, which is important and necessary. But um, we can show them love and offer what we can offer. Uh, always feel free to um, invite your friends to come and be with us. Uh, it is a, always a blessing to, to see you and to share. Uh, following the meal, I think um, Reza has ordering some. Are you ordering some uh, cake for us or something? Have a, okay, good. He's always on top of these things. He's a good man. Uh, so, uh, what meal is right without some dessert? Huh? Uh, I told you the story about Nina's dad. Uh, he worked for 30 years and came home and his, her mom had a wonderful meal prepared for him. And every night for 30 years, he asked, what's for dessert? And every night he got the same answer, nothing. And he looked surprised and finally she said to him, you always ask this question, and you always know there's nothing, why do you keep asking it? He said, there's always hope. And so <laughs> we, we have hope that uh, the cake will be enjoyed tonight. So praise the Lord. We hope also, we have a lot of things we hope for. Uh, the students doing well in the universities, uh, your health, your well-being, uh, those that travel, um, just many, many things. 
And so we make it a matter of regular prayer. Uh, we've got a prayer box at the back of the, um, near the entrance as you come in. Uh, there's paper and pencil there, so please uh, take a minute and put your prayer request down because we do pray seriously uh, for all of your requests. Uh, if you brought an offering for the Lord, we, don't, we haven't been taking an offering, but that doesn't mean that um, it's not um, appreciated uh, and needed. Uh, it's an expensive world we live in, so there is an offering box back there as well. Uh, if you care to leave an offering, um, it's up to you. We really appreciate that too. So God bless you. Um, I don't know of any other prayer requests, but um, it's a joy. To, do we have any special music today? We've got special music. Praise the Lord. Okay, so we'll have our music, and then we will have our message today. Oh, we're all having the Lord's table today following uh, our uh, look at God's Word. So um, it's open communion, so feel free to stay in and be with us. Say your 
That's beautiful and so true, really. Uh, I was just told we have a birthday today. Our dear friend Darina, happy birthday, sweetheart. Uh, so the cake, this, be sure and stay for the cake afterwards and greet this lovely young lady uh, on her birthday. Uh, there's a definition of young ladies. Uh, they say the definition of a man, he goes through life stages. He's born an infant. He becomes a child. He becomes a young man, he becomes a middle age, he becomes an old man. It's different with a girl. She's an infant, she's a child, she's a young lady, she's a young lady, she's a young lady, she's a young lady. So they just, they just don't uh, change, they just stay as lovely as ever. And we thank you ladies for your loveliness. It's, uh, I know you uh, spend a lot of time uh, thinking about us guys and helping us to cope in life and we need you. Um, before I met my sweet wife, uh, I was full of grease and car stuff and car parts and yucky stuff. And uh, I took her into a garage and she, ooh, it was just, she filled my life with lace and perfume and smiles and good things. And so thank you, dear sweeter. So it's a lovely thing to follow the Lord and have his blessing in our life. Today, we want to look at a very important topic concerning our future. Matthew 11 that we had in our scripture reading, the one verse, come to me, Jesus said, it's an offer he's making, all you who labor and are heavy laden, when you have problems in your life, uh, when life gets you down, it's important to remember to come to Jesus with those. He promises, I will give you rest. Uh, he told us in another place, cast your cares upon me. Uh, I explained to you in a previous uh, message that uh, the young men in America play this game basketball. They have this ball, they bounce, and they throw it through a hoop and make a point. Uh, picture all your troubles in a ball, like a basketball. And um, take the, all the troubles, the burns, the fears, everything you have, put them in this ball and cast it to Jesus. Cast your cares upon me, he says. And um, I'll, I'll bless you, I'll help you. I'll take your troubles. Uh, so when you get up off your knees, if you start worrying again or having the troubles again, it means that you didn't leave them with Jesus. You took them back. Trust him. Give him your troubles and leave them there. Trust him to deal with it. He knows what he's doing. He, there's nothing impossible for God. So he says in verse 29, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. So take is an offer he's making to us. Learn from me. I am gentle and lowly in heart. You will find rest for your souls. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. God meets each and every individual need. He has his own way of speaking to our soul. He starts with us with something known to us. Probably everyone here has heard about this woman, Helen Keller. Uh, she was blind, deaf, and mute. She couldn't see, uh, she couldn't uh, hear, and she couldn't talk. Wow. What a challenge. This young girl, how are you going to teach her? How are you going to communicate? What's going on in her head? Uh, you think, why? Why did God let some child be born like this? What's the purpose of it? How did it happen? My guess is that God, look, I, I, I'm just guessing, it seems to me like God did this maybe for two reasons. And again, it's just a guess. He wanted to show that when you have nothing, he can satisfy your soul. 
He can come into your life, into your heart, and he can give you some reason for living, some purpose, some, some joy that you can't get anywhere else. And it's proven through her life. The second reason might be, there was a very compassionate woman named Annie Sullivan. Annie Sullivan met this young girl and saw the plight she was in. How was she going to live her life? So Annie Sullivan dedicated her life to Helen Keller. Through touch, she taught her how to read. She taught her to describe the world to her. She taught her so many things, but it's amazing the results. Um, I think that uh, her biographer writes this. Even though she was a prisoner of darkness, deprived of outside light, the, the uh, darkness and silence was unique, she writes, uh, and um, willing to, to kindle a spark from within through this touch. The biographer says uh, her dedicated teacher, meaning Ani Sullivan, was the one who led her out of, into a larger world and enabled her to communicate by the sense of touch. This teacher, Ani Sullivan, by touching the girl's hand, started teaching her the alphabet, started spelling things to her, started communicating with her. Uh, the, the young lady learned to touch back and to ask questions, and um, it was amazing. Uh, so how could God communicate with her, or how could she communicate with God? Her, her biographer, biographer writes, her teacher decided to try to tell her a story of God's salvation in Jesus Christ. Using the language of touch, she did her best. At the end, Helen Keller responded, Oh, I knew he must exist, but I didn't know his name. Wow. To think that you know there's a God, but you don't know his name. Places in the world still like that. That's why we send missionaries out. Places in the world where they don't know that God loves them, that they don't know that he cares and wants them to be with him in heaven. They don't know that he wants to help them overcome all their problems and bless them. The biographer writes, God had revealed himself to her in a very special way. Indeed, he did. Uh, this girl wound up graduating from university, believe it or not, graduated from university without being able to see, hear, or talk. And her testimony spread to the entire world. We're here today talking about her a little bit. And all over the world, her name is known, Helen Keller. What an amazing story. And thank God for people like Ani Sullivan, who dedicate themselves to help others. I would suggest that all of you try to do that. I try to do it. See somebody that has a need and try to help them. Do what you can. Maybe you can't do much, but even a little bit can be appreciated. Jesus said, even if you offer a cup of cold water in the name of the Lord, you get a prophet's reward. God watches what you do, and he wants to help you and bless you. And when you try to do something to help other people in any way that God puts it on your heart, you're obeying God and getting a blessing yourself. So God wants to reach each and every one of us, and um, according to our need and our ability to comprehend so whatever level you're on academically, God knows where you are. And he wants to communicate with you like he did with Helen Keller. He wants to show you a better way to live. He wants to show you how to make progress in your life, how to be a better person, how to be like Jesus Christ. And that's why we, this morning I've titled the message, Learning All Things from Jesus. Why do we want to learn from Jesus? Because when Jesus is in your heart, he satisfies completely. When Christ is there, all other things take second place. We accept Christ as our Savior, and it's a wonderful day. I'll never forget the day that I became a Christian, how my life changed, just like that. When you have Christ in you, the hope comes, the joy comes, the progress comes, the knowledge comes. Uh, it's a whole new world that opens up, that lies before us, and we didn't even know it was there. A world of adventure a world of blessings, but we have a lot to learn to get the maximum benefit from this new spiritual life. We're told a lot of things. 
As I remind you, a human baby born doesn't know anything. When it's five, it knows more. When it's 15, it knows more. When it's 30, it knows more. And so life is a progress of learning. And it's the same with the spiritual life. You first come to God and you don't know very much, but as you participate in Bible studies and churches and prayers and singing and worship, you learn and you grow. So if you want the maximum benefit, you're going to do what Jesus invites us to do. Matthew eleven twenty nine. 29, take. That is an offer to you. It's like he's got a present and he's saying, take. Here, here, I'm holding it for you. Take it. Take my yoke upon you. So he's offering us a yoke. Learn from me. So he's offering, come, take, and learn. Why would we want to do that? Because we're going to get the maximum benefit out of our lives. It is going to be a great advantage for us because God loves us and wants the best, like any parent. He's our heavenly father, and therefore, he wants the best for each and every one of us. He wants to bless us. He wants to provide for us and encourage us. So, Jesus wants to teach us to have a holy life. And first, and most important thing, is you must yoke your life to Jesus Christ uh, to learn from him. Now, what does this mean uh, to yoke to him? Well, here we have a picture on the screen of a yoke. Uh, this is what they do when they, in the old days before tractors, uh, they had these yokes. And um, um, an animal would get in the one side, and, well, two animals really, in, a, in the case of a farm or heavy work to be done. Jesus is offering to yoke together in a team. Here we have a picture of the animals that are yoked together in a team. So you have many animals doing very, very heavy work. Um, this is what Jesus is offering. Jesus is saying, I want you, my children, to yoke willingly yourself, yoke to me. I'm, I'm offering to yoke my life with yours. You, like, you, you, are, you are being offered to yoke your life to mine. In the case of animals, the strongest and smartest animal is the lead animal in the team. He sets the course for every, everyone to follow. The, the owner of the team leads the lead horse, or the lead animal, and the lead animal leads all the others. Jesus is saying, God the Father is leading you. I'm in your heart. When you yoke together with me, I'm, I'm the leader, I'm the strongest, I'm the wisest, I know where I'm going, I know what I'm doing. I've got the message from the Father, I'm following God. His, his, the, his the God the Father is the administrative head of the Godhead. I am leading you, I'm showing you how to live a better life, how to be holy. And that's what we want to learn today. So, what kind of a God are we serving? What condescension? God, who created us, who gave us life, condescends to be like us, to live in our heart. When we do sinful things, he doesn't leave us. Where We're taking him into sinful things, sinful thinking, or whatever it happens to be. And so, with great mercy... He teaches us day by day with great patience and great forgiveness. Um, those of you who have, have had children, not very many of you here have. Uh, we got a new mom, so. <laughs> uh, we, we love our children. We see they're just children. They make mistakes. When they make mistakes, something wrong, even disobedience, we don't throw them out. We continue to love them and forgive them and teach them and work with them. And that's so, so good. Take means that you must make a decision. As you sit here this morning in the comfort of fellowship with Jesus, make a decision to take the yoke of Jesus Christ yourself. He's offering you to put yourself under him. He's going to lead you. He's going to guide you. He's going to help you and provide for you. You Decide to follow Jesus with your thoughts, your actions, and your life. 1 Peter 2.21 says, Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that we should follow in his steps. The Christian life is a life of self-sacrifice. You've got your own ways that you want to go, and some of those ways are not right. It's not what God made you for. God made you for a particular purpose, 
And you've got to figure out what that purpose is and get in the yoke with Jesus. Being a Christian means that you sacrifice your will and you submit to God to plan your life for you, to show you what he wants you to do. And the whole time he's going to bless you, he's going to help you. Uh, Romans 12, the Apostle Paul put it this way, I beseech you, which means I beg you. The Apostle Paul was a very emotionally driven man. At one point he said, I, I spoke with someone trying to lead them to faith in Christ for three days and nights with tears, really uh, trying to convince them. Uh, Felix said, almost you have persuaded me to be a Christian. When I was a fairly new Christian, and I just sort of met Nina in Bible University there, um, a young lady and man was walking down the street toward me, and I, I was just so, so excited about Jesus. I ran up to them, and I was just telling them with all excitement. And the young girl said to me, you really believe that, don't you? <laughs> yes, I really believe it. Uh, so when you, when you have this conviction in you, 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 you just you radiate the, 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 the will of the Lord and the joy of the Lord. So he says, I beg you, therefore, brethren, he's talking to Christians, by the mercies of God, God's mercy in your life has been great, that you present your bodies. He's telling you, I'm begging you, present yourself to God, a living sacrifice. A living sacrifice means that you're, you're not going to be a martyr. You're not going to be like an Old Testament uh, sacrifice where they uh, offered it on the, uh, on the altar and burnt it. You're a living sacrifice. That means day by day, you're going to have Christ in your heart. You're going to live for him. You're going to not go the selfish way. You are going to present yourself to him as a living sacrifice. You're sacrificing yourself to him. He says, which you, you're to be holy, uh, not sinful. You are to be acceptable to God, and that's your reasonable service. In verse 2 he says, do not be conformed to this world. Why? The world is the enemy of God. He says anybody that loves the world is, hates God. The world hates God. It's not our way, dear Christian friends. How are you going to be transformed? Be transformed by the renewing of your mind up here where you really live. You've got to get your thinking straight. You've got to control your thinking. Bring every thought into captivity to the obedience of Jesus Christ. When you start thinking wrong thoughts, I want to talk to you about that in a couple of minutes. You have to control your thoughts because that, your thoughts are going to determine everything. That's what he's saying here. Renew your mind. Get the rubbish out of your mind. Um, they wanted to put a building over here for us. The ground had rubble on it. They had to get rid of the rubble before they could put the building. You, when you come to Jesus Christ, you've got rubble. You've got all kinds of sins and bad ideas and whatever in your mind. Get them out of there. They're lying to you. They're, they're wrong. And you start building a new building, a new life on the principles of the Bible and what God says. Renewing your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You need the truth. Satan has been deceiving us. A living sacrifice means that you will be greatly rewarded. If you do what Christ is saying here, you will be greatly rewarded forever for your sacrifice. Romans 8, 18, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. I don't know uh, if you ever, years ago when I used to watch movies, I don't watch them anymore because they're all nonsense. I mean, the, the stuff Hollywood puts out there is either garbage and trash and rude and ignorant or stupid. I mean, now they've got a movie where somebody goes like this and fire comes out of their hand and boom or something. Or, uh, it's just crazy stuff. But uh, there was a movie made Star Wars. It uh, had some interest. I was interested in that, and I saw that movie. And at the end of it, the heroes were presented to the chief there, and everybody was standing there, and they were walking, and they were put up with a, with a special recognition, special uh, sort of like gold thing on them or something. I don't know exactly what it was. That's you before God. You will be presented before God. You will be... You, you will be rewarded, unbelievably. It can't be compared with what you're doing now. Everybody will be there and they will see what you've done with your life. And you will be given great reward for that. That's what he's saying here, Matthew 19, 29. Everyone 
who has left houses or brothers or sisters or fathers or mothers or wife or children or lands for my name's sake shall receive a hundredfold in this life and eternal life. And in heaven, you get that beautiful home not made with hands. So what's our problem? We grow up in a sinful world that does not obey or follow God. It's hostile to God and holiness. Life is often so hard. The way of the transgressor is hard. So instead of turning to God, as we should, to cope with the pressures of life, we have a problem. We're in the world. We're not of the world. We're surrounded by the world, worldly people. Broad is the road that leads to destruction. Many people are on it. Narrow is the road that leads to life everlasting. Few people find it. We're all here this morning because we love Jesus and we want to learn from him. But out there, there's a million people in our city, more than a million, more coming every day from the villages. They don't really know a clear understanding of God. They call themselves Christian, but they don't have a Bible. They don't really understand. They don't know God. They don't follow God. They follow the world. Uh, and whatever seems right to them, they do. And they follow the pressures put upon them by their peer group. Uh, and the world takes pleasures in sin, uh, not knowing that it will destroy them and give them a guilty conscience and a feeling of shame. So when you look at the world and the results of the world, it's misery. Uh, it's, it's, it's yucky. When you look at what Christ offers you, holiness, blessings, helping you in every way, you get 100% of his help in this life, which is short compared. By the time you enter your career, you're close to 30 years old. You retire at 60, 70. So you get 30, 40 years of active life. And you give it all to this world that's corrupted? And you don't think about giving yourself as a living sacrifice to God? That he could bless you and help you survive in this wicked world? I'm appealing to your sense of common sense. Think about it. You've got to choose which path you want to get on. He's saying, yield to God. Satan takes advantage of us. He's a liar. He's a deceiver. He was thrown out of heaven. He presents himself as an angel of light. He makes you think, how can it be wrong when it feels so right? And you go on indulging in sins because of the little bit of pleasure you get out of it. He makes you think, I, I, I know this is not exactly right, but I need it in my life. I, I'm weak. I'm only human. Uh, I, 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 I'm not strong enough. I don't have a strong enough will. And to our shame, we learn to commit sins. We accept worldly thinking and worldly activity, we hear their philosophy, we hear their foul language every day, and we succumb to it. It becomes normal in our world. It's not a holy world. The whole world lies in the lap of the evil one. And this evil rubs off on us, so to speak. We think it's normal. Everybody's doing it as though that justifies us doing some of it too. Moses figured out that it was wrong. He did the right thing in Hebrews 11, 24 to 6, by faith. Now, here's a man of God. He's got faith. By faith, Moses, when he became of age, he left his home. He was with mom and uh, not, not long, any longer with mom and dad. He refused. He made a decision. He refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, Choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. So I made a choice. He could have been the Pharaoh of Egypt. He could have had anything he wanted. The, the Egypt was the superpower of the day. He could have been the leader there. And at his command, anything could happen. He rejected that. Egypt had hundreds of false gods. They worshipped cats. They worshipped, well, if you have a cat, please don't think I'm against cats. <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> but they, they would, they would um, embalm cats. Uh, they, they made the sphinx. Uh, they, they had all kinds of things that they worshipped, except the God of heaven. And so uh, this 
Moses compared his mom and his mom and dad had told him about the God of heaven. Uh, and so he knew about it. And so he said, I'm going to choose God and his ways rather than the pleasures that I could get being the king of Egypt. He says, verse 26, esteeming the reproaches of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he looked to the reward. Moses was not a stupid man. He looked to the future. He looked past this world. He looked to heaven. He saw what God said about heaven. Beautiful streets of gold, angels up there, a joy forever in the presence of the Lord is continual joy. No problems of any kind. Forever. Uh, full joy in your heart. Uh, it's just amazing uh, what God has planned for us. And Moses looked at that and he said, okay, this is forever. This life is 40, 50, 60 years and it's over. I can have sinful pleasure now. It's not going to satisfy. It leaves you empty. It leaves you feeling guilty. And yet we succumb to it. I'm trying to get you to make a decision today. Decide to give your heart to Jesus Christ. Give your life to him. Present yourself to God a living sacrifice. Say, God, I've had it with this world. It doesn't satisfy me. It's miserable. I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm guilty of, of doing wrong things. I need to learn your ways. Many of us get corrupted and we participate in sinful lifestyles and sinful and selfishness for personal pleasure. Thank God for Jesus. He's our God. He's our King. He's our friend. He came to save us. He came to rescue us. He came to, to get us to where we don't have sin's grip on us, sin's power over us. He can deliver us to where we can be free from this. Wesley, who started the Methodist Church, uh, he put it in his famous hymn, Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing. One of my favorite hymns. One stanza has it. Jesus breaks the power of canceled sin. He sets the prisoner free. His blood can make the foulest clean. His blood availed for me. Wesley gave his life to God as a living sacrifice. He preached more sermons than any other human being has ever done. He preached three times a day. Every day, 365 days a year, for 40 years, on a horseback, riding through England. It was, I don't know, 1700 or something. They didn't have cars and things, phones or nothing. And this man loved God so much, he would go to a mining area. He would call the miners out of the ground. They were digging coal. They'd come out with soot all over their face. He would preach to them very strong, and he would keep preaching until two streams of tears would come down their face to wash the soot off of their face. What a man. He understood God. He was a living sacrifice. Maybe God won't call you to buy a horse next week and go do something like that. But, but being a living sacrifice in today's world where you are to show Jesus your love back to him. When you give your heart to Jesus Christ, everything in your life changes, everything. Jesus forgives all your sins. He gives you power over habitual sins. You have to learn it. It's not automatic. It's not like wham. Just like a child from age 5 to age 15 has many things to learn. You've got many things to learn. You can learn to overcome sin's power, sin's grip on you through Jesus Christ, only through Jesus Christ. Uh, Romans 6.14, sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. That's a, that's a beautiful verse there. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5.17, therefore, if anyone uh, is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. What happens here? Jesus works in your heart to change you, to change you from what you are to what you should be. And um, he says... Um, uh, you can know that he wants you to become like him, uh, to produce, to, to make you like another Jesus walking around. If you have his attitude in his work. Uh, Philippians 1.6 uh, tells us, being confident of this very thing, he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. So Jesus begins a good work in you 
begins a good work in you. He completes it. Every day of your life, Jesus is working on you. Every minute of every day, he never leaves you, never forsakes you. He's working in you, talking to your heart, talking to your head, reminding you of Bible verses, encouraging you, providing for you, like a, like a mother watching a toddler child. Jesus cares about you. He cares about everything about you. He wants you to have a full reward. He's offering you in heaven a full reward, a maximum reward that you can have. And he's saying, I've got this for you. I know what your potential is. I know what your limitations are. I don't expect you to do something you're not gifted to do. I'll work in your life. I'll develop you to the maximum that you can do individually. So to overcome your previous life of sins, there are two things you must do. Two things. The great man, the Apostle Paul, said in Philippians 3, 12 through 16, he mentions these two things. He says, not that I have already attained or am already perfect. Now, he was an older man when he said this. He said, look, I'm pursuing, I'm a living sacrifice, I'm working on it, I, I continue to work on it, God continues to work on me. I've advanced far, I'm not there yet. I'm not like Jesus Christ exactly. I'm still working on it. He says, I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Jesus had a special work for the Apostle Paul. And he was developing him as he was going in this special work. Uh, Helen Keller needed somebody to help her. Anna Sullivan was that somebody. She gave her life to God to work with Helen Keller. God wants you, he's got a purpose for you. You've got to figure out what God's purpose is for your life, and you've got to give yourself to Jesus for that. So the first thing you do, verse 13, brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, I'm not there yet, I'm not perfect yet, this one thing I do. What is it, Paul? What's the one thing you do? Forgetting those things which are behind. Friends, that's the first step. Forget what sins you did even yesterday. Forget them. That's what Paul said. The second thing you must do, reaching forward to those things which are ahead. So you forget the past, and you look ahead, that's what Moses did. He forgot Egypt and the sins of Egypt. He looked ahead for the reward. He looked for heaven and the promises. He says, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. I'm, I'm like an Olympic runner. I, I've, I, I'm running a race. I want to win that race. I, I'm putting everything I can into it. I want to get there. I am... I am asking God to help me. I'm developing. Therefore, verse 15, let us, as many as are mature, have this in mind. And if anything else you think otherwise, God will reveal even this to you. Nevertheless, to the degree that we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule. Let us be of the same mind. God says, take this example. Forget your past. Okay, you're just human. You made mistakes. You made sins. Some of them pretty big sins. In my case, yes, I did to my shame. God says, forget it. God says, don't focus on that. Look forward at the prize of the high calling of God in Christ. So the first thing you do is to forget the sins you did yesterday. This one thing I do, he said. Are you beating yourself up? because of some weakness in your life? Are you dominated by some sin? You just can't get past it? No matter how hard you try, no matter what you do, the sin keeps coming back, and you can't get past it, you can't get over it? Even though you may have committed it a long time ago, it's coming up into your thinking, and you think, how could I have done that? And you have regret, and you wish you could take back some words you said to somebody, you can't take them back. You can apologize for it, but you can't take them back. So you suffer emotionally 
You feel sad, you feel depressed, you feel unforgiven. You feel that you have no power to go on. Uh, sin has overcome you, and you have given it your best shot. You've done everything you know to do, and yet you continue in this sin to your own regret. And you don't know what to do. You're stuck. You feel ignorant. You feel weak. You feel hopeless. I want to try to brighten your eyes a little bit to give you some knowledge of what God says and hope that Jesus will forgive your past failures and strengthen you for future victories. Start, number one, start by forgiving yourself. Rededicate yourself to learning from Jesus Christ. He offers, take my yoke, learn from me. Jesus will teach you how to overcome. Just like Helen Keller had uh, Anna Sullivan to teach her everything, Jesus Christ wants the, you to yoke with him, and he will teach you. If you walk with him, he will teach you how to live like him, how to overcome sin and weakness. So the rule is forget your past failures. You're human. You made mistakes. Welcome to the club. We're all there. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. How about the Pope? How about, how about the Pope? Yeah, he's got holy clothes on, right? Uh, yeah, he's a sinner. How about Mary, the mother of Jesus? Sinner. God says all have sinned. Don't worry about them. God judges them individually. What about you? You know you've sinned. I know I've sinned. I'm not proud of it, but we all are there. So forget the past failures um, and start by forgiving yourself. Rededicate yourself to learning from Jesus how to overcome. Uh, so the rule is to forget your past because they are forgiven and they are cleansed. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful, he will do it. He is just, he can do it. To forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So what is he saying? He's saying that the sins you did yesterday, if you confess them to him, even if you did a sin this morning, he says, if you confess it to him in your heart, he knows you did it anyway, you confess it to him, he will number one, forgive you, and number two, he will cleanse you. When you become a Christian, he cleanses all the sins off your soul. You are clean, like a newborn baby who's done nothing wrong. He says, keep yourself unspotted by the world. As you go through this sinful world, you get spots on your soul. How are you going to get rid of them? 1 John 1, 9. There's some people call it the soap bar of the New Testament. You, you, you confess your sins and he cleans, as you confess them, he cleans these spots off your soul. He says, keep yourself pure. You're not to get involved in sinful things. You're to be holy, but you need his help. So Peter came to Jesus in Matthew 18 and said, Lord, how often shall all my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Of the seven times, Peter thought he was being generous. Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but 70 times seven. That's 490 times, Jesus said, you forgive somebody every day. 490 times. It means inexhaustible love. It means forgiveness and patience. Uh, in America, many people have a garage for their car. They have children who they buy bicycles for. Imagine a dad parks his, wants to park his car in the garage and he comes home from work and there's his child's bicycle laying flat on the driveway. He's got to open the door, get out of his car, and move the bicycle in order to get into his garage. Ah, that kid of mine, why doesn't he learn to take care of that bicycle? Okay, so he goes in and he says to his son, don't do that. Supposing he comes the next day and the bicycle's there again. And he goes and again confronts his son. Suppose it happens every day for a week, seven days. That's what Peter is saying. Should I forgive my brother seven times? That'd be pretty hard. 
Jesus said, no, not seven times, 70 times, 490. If your kid does it 490 times, forgive him. Wow. Being holy is, takes, the, takes God in your heart to enable you to have that kind of grace. But that's what God does for you. You have the confidence that no matter how wicked you've been, God will forgive you and cleanse you through Jesus Christ. And you can stay clean. The promise again, a great promise, uh, Romans 6.14, sin shall not have dominion over you. You are not under the law, but under grace. Sin dominates the unconverted people. They cannot stop sinning. Uh, they, 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 their sins are called life-dominating sins. I've dealt with alcoholics. They deny, they're in denial. They say, I'm not an alcoholic. And uh, meanwhile, they've got a bottle hidden in their coat pocket. Uh, they... they Drink to ruination. But the power of the blood of Jesus Christ is the only thing that can defeat sin and defeat Satan. Instructions for living a successful life is giving in these verses of Romans we were just reading, especially in verse 13, we'll come to in a moment. And it's the word yield. That's what I want to impress on you, yield. When a temptation comes to do wrong, you must yield to God. Now that's a choice you must make. Everything in you wants to do the sin. It's a habit that you've developed. It's pleasure in that, the pleasures of sin for a season. You want to do that. Now you're a Christian. You want to follow God. You want to do the right thing. You feel weak. What are you going to do? Yield to Jesus. Uh, let's read the passage here, Romans 6, starting in verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Knowing ye not that as many of us that were baptized into Jesus Christ, we were baptized into his death. Uh, we had a baptism yesterday. Uh, 21 precious people got baptized. When the pastor put you under the water, he is the baptizing agent. He's the one that puts you under the water and takes you out of the water. Uh, if I'm baptizing you and you're naughty, I might hold you down till the bubbles stop coming up. No, I won't, I won't really do that. Uh, just joking. I'm trying to lighten things up here a little bit. Uh, no, uh, the, the, bap the pastor is the baptizing agent. When you receive Jesus Christ as your Savior, Without you knowing it, in heaven, uh, we don't have time to look at it, but it's Romans 12, 13. No, 1 first, first Corinthians 12, 13. 12, yeah, 1 Corinthians 12, 13. You are baptized by the Holy, the Holy Spirit is the baptizing agent. He baptizes you into the body of Jesus Christ. You become a Christian through the Holy Spirit's work baptizing you into, the, he is the baptizing agent in heaven. And that's, that's, that makes you a member of the family of Jesus Christ. So you are now a Christian. God has come to live in your heart. Uh, he says, um, verse 3, Know you not that as many of us were baptized into Christ, were baptized to his death? Because Jesus Christ died, we're to die to our old sins, our old way of living. Uh, Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism unto death, as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father. We should walk in newness of life. He says, because you are a Christian, and you've been baptized into the body of Jesus Christ, Christ is in you, you now should offer yourself a living sacrifice to Jesus Christ to walk in newness of life. You're not going to walk in the ways of the world anymore. You're going to deliberately choose to learn about Jesus Christ and follow his ways. Uh, verse 10, For in that he died, he died unto sin once, but that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise, reckon yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now verse 12, let not sin therefore reign in your mortal bodies, that you should obey it in its lust thereof. Neither yield, there's that word yield, neither yield you your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. What's he saying here? He's saying when you are tempted to do something wrong, you've got two paths that you can go. You can yield to the sin. You can give in to the sin, and you can, you can go with that, or you can yield to the Holy Spirit and go that way. So this fight that's in you, 
You have got to discipline yourself through your thinking to convince yourself how you're going to overcome that temptation. And I want to help you with that. Number one, stop self negative self talk. Oh, I'm just a sinner. Oh, I'm, I'm weak. Oh, I'm, I'm stupid. Oh, how could I do that? Negative self talk. My father, all my life when I was growing up, I was a very hard man. He told me, I'm very stupid. He called me, You stupid kid. Uh, he said, You'll never amount to anything. Uh, when you're 10 years old and your father tells you you're stupid, he's God in your life. You think you're, you're stupid. Um, he never had any confidence in me, never gave me any self-confidence. Uh, my father's words echoed in my head for many years until I became a Christian. I began to learn there's other ways to think. Jesus invited me to cast my cares to him, to yoke with him, to yield to him. And it took a long time to learn my father was wrong. I had to stop negative self-talk. I still did some of it recently, and a friend here sitting here today helped me through counsel, helped me to understand not to do that. I, I had to speak the truth to myself. I'm not stupid. My father was wrong. I have amounted to something, uh, to something important in God's eyes. And it's only because of Jesus and his word. Without him, I am nothing. I have no power. I have no hope. Jesus Christ, through the truth, has given me this promise. It's a very liberating promise. Jesus, in John 8, 31 and 32, Jesus speaking. Jesus said to those Jews who believed in him, I believe in him. If you abide in my word, you live in my word, you are my disciples indeed. You shall know the truth from my word, and the truth, it, the truth, shall make you free. The truth sets you free. When you are, when you are tempted to do something wrong, and you stop, before you, before you take any action, and you look at where that sin has taken you before, you see the misery that it brings you to, you see the pain it brings into your heart, and then the sufferings that you have from it. And, and then you, you, you look forward and you see the blessings of God and the holiness and the rewards and, and everything. It helps you to make the choice. You stop and you think, and you think about the outcome of each one. What a beautiful word. What a promise. Free from fear. Free from doubt. Free from worry. Free from negative self-talk. The truth makes you free. You're following a lie. You're following a deception of Satan. Satan tells you everybody's doing it, the sin you're doing. Satan tells you, you, you need it, you're weak, you, you can't stop. Nobody's going to judge you. In fact, if you stop it, they're going to think you're weird. You don't want them to think that about you, do you? You want to go along with the crowd, you want to be popular. And so you continue this negative self-talk. You convince yourself that it's justifiable because everybody's doing it. And you wind up miserable, feeling hopeless, feeling dirty, feeling guilty. That's where it leads you. That's the deceit, this deceit of Satan to, to make you feel that way. Free. I say to you, what a beautiful word to be free. You're no longer in the prison of wrong thinking. Let me give you a conclusion and we'll go. Number one, what have I said to you? Forget past sins you have committed because God does. God forgets what you've done. Isaiah 43, 25, I, even I, am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake. I will not remember your sins. I uh, just imagine myself in heaven one day in the future sitting by the crystal sea. Uh, and, and the earth, the only thing I can imagine is what I have here on earth. There's an umbrella and a, a nice big umbrella and a, and a table. And I imagine that and I'm sitting there drinking a nice lemonade or something. And uh, Jesus walks by. And uh, I say, oh, Jesus, uh, sorry to trouble you. You got a minute? Could, could you sit? I got something I want to say to you. Okay, it's something I want to ask you. Sure, what, what is it? And he sits down. 
Jesus, when I was back on earth, I, I did some pretty bad things, and I, I really feel shame, and I just want to tell you I, I'm really sorry and uh, ask you again to please forgive me. Jesus will say, what are you talking about? I, for, I, I forgot it. He doesn't remember it anymore. That's what he's saying here. When you confess it, he cleanses it, he forgives you, and he forgets it. You should too. Stop beating yourself up. Stop saying negative thoughts about yourself. Oh, I can't do it. I'm stupid. I'm, I'm weak. I, I don't have any willpower. He'll give it to you if you walk with him. He'll show you the truth. The truth will set you free. So, when Satan attacks you to remind you of a sin you committed, resist him. Remind yourself that you are forgiven and you are clean. Tell Satan, yes, it's true, I did it, but I've been forgiven, and I'm clean. <laughs> Take that. Well, maybe you don't have to do that, but that's what I do to him. I get behind my back, Satan. The second thing you do, you reach forward to those things which are ahead. That's what he said, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Look forward, not backward. Don't look over your shoulder at the things you've done. Look forward to where you're going. It doesn't matter where you've been. You're forgiven for that. It matters where you're going. It matters the direction you're going now. You should go forward for Jesus Christ. Give yourself as a living sacrifice. Learn from him. Learn how he thinks. Learn how he acts. Learn what he does. Learn his heart. Go that direction. You'll get a full reward in heaven. Um, yesterday's gone. You can't do anything about it. You can't undo something you've done. You can't take back words you've said. You can apologize for them, but you're forgiven and cleansed because of Jesus Christ. So put it behind you. Move forward to your great reward promised by our Lord. His power, His grace, His mercy is available to you as you become stronger in His love. It is the love of Christ that constrains us. That means the love of Christ controls us. When you look at Jesus Christ there on the cross, dying for your sins, and you look into his face and you see the pain that his body is under, and he's bearing that for you and me to forgive our sins. That love that he's showing means that I want to give myself to him. He gave himself for me. I want to give myself to him. Learn to yoke together with Jesus and be prudent. The last verse, Proverbs 22, verse 3. A prudent man foresees evil and hides himself, but the simple pass on and are punished. What does it mean? It means as you're living your life day by day, minute by minute, and Satan comes at you with a temptation, a sin, something that maybe has been a habit in your life or something else, some new sin maybe, there you are at the crossroads. This says a wise man hides himself because he sees where that's going. He sees that it's going to make him miserable. He sees that it's going to be judged by God. He sees that he's going to get dirty. He sees that he's going to be punished. And he hides himself. He doesn't go there. He doesn't do that. The simple man who doesn't know God or his stupid man he goes right ahead, oh boy, this is fun. Boom, down he goes, guilty, with no one to help him. When you walk with Jesus Christ, you get his power, you get his love, you get everything he promised you, but it's your decision. You have to offer yourself, I beg you, brothers, by the mercies of God, present yourselves to God, a living sacrifice. It's up to you. You do it. God doesn't do it for you. He will give you the power, the knowledge, and the strength, but you do it. He will clean you when you fall. He forgives you 100, uh, 490 times a day for the same sin. He forgives you and loves you and wants you to succeed. He wants you to have a full reward. But you've got to have some skin in the game. You've got to get into the fight. You've got you've to you've confess your sins. You've got to know that you're cleansed, you're, you're pure. There's no sin in you. It's gone. Forget that. Keep pressing onward. Keep, keep, keep going toward the goal. What's the target? To be like Jesus Christ. To think like him. To act like him. To have the same attitude he had about everything. About money. About everything. You're going to have his attitude. You're going to develop your life to be, like Paul said, for me to live as Christ and to die as gain. Jesus Christ wants to relive his life through you and me. 
When people see us, when they said to, when they follow, saw the first Christians, they called them Christians. They didn't call them Baptist or Methodist or Catholics. They, they said, these are Christians. What does that mean? Christ-like ones. These people are acting like Jesus Christ. He's, they're, 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 it's like Jesus Christ is reliving his life through them. That's what it means. It means that you are human. You're going to have weaknesses. You're going to have challenges. But it means that Jesus Christ is in you to give you power as you grow. And again, don't punish yourself too much. You don't expect a five-year-old child to do what a 15-year-old kid can do. If you're new in the Lord, there's time to grow. Stay with it. Keep, keep yourself in church. Keep in Bible studies. Keep good Christian friends. Fellowship together. I wish I could go on. My time's gone. I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, what can I say? When you're tempted to evil in thought or action, look where the sin will take you. Look what it's going to do to you. See by prudence, the prudent man hides himself. By prudence, see the end of it. Before you do it, stop for just a minute. Think, where is this going? If, if, I, if I do this sin, where is it going to get? Where, what's the end game here? What am I going to get out of this? A little bit of personal pleasure for a little short time? A prudent man says, no, I'll, I'll, I'll do like Moses. I, I'm going I'm to follow God. And you get great blessings, great comfort, great peace in your heart, great love. And you get rewarded. So, sin has a way of sneaking up on you. No drunk at his first drink, he takes that first drink, and no drunk thinks to himself, boy, I just can't wait till this ruins me. Oh, boy, I'm just going to keep on drinking this. I know I'm going to be in the gutter one day. I'm going to lose my family. I'm going to lose my job. I'm going to lose everything. Ah, but that's what I want. I want this drink. This drink's more important to me than anything else. And they become an alcoholic. Isn't that stupid? To give your life to a bottle of beer. There are medical doctors in America who lost everything. Their family, their, their, their practice. They, they're, they're outside of the helping up mission, looking in the trash can for a bottle of beer that might have a little drop of beer in the bottom of it because they don't have any money. And they want that little bit of beer that's left in the bottom. What a shame. What a waste of a life. Sin dominates them. They can't stop it. You can stop it. You've got Jesus Christ in your heart. You, you can yield to him. You can give yourself to him. He will work with you. He will teach you. Jesus said, come to me. Take my yoke upon you. Learn from me. You can do it. It's up to you. You've got a choice to make. It's in your thinking. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So dear friends, come to Jesus. Receive his love and forgiveness. Believe his word. Be led by his spirit. Yoke with him. Acts 16.30, and we're finished. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? So they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved, you and your household, because you'll take the gospel to them, and they will believe too. Heavenly Father, we thank you very much for your truths that you teach us. Lord, it's just wonderful to have your word and the positive thing to know that the truth can set us free. What a great thing, Lord, to be set free from the domination of sin. We don't have to follow this sin. We can be holy people. We can be righteous through Jesus Christ and only through Jesus Christ. Help us, Lord. We need you. We're your children. You have parental obligations to us. Please, Lord. We offer ourselves to you best we can as living sacrifices. Dear friends, while our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, and those uh, on the internet who are listening, if you have never received Jesus Christ into your heart, we give you this moment. This is for you. If you believe that Jesus Christ is God, best you can, and you believe by faith that he died on the cross for your sins, and you believe that he rose from the dead as alive today, and you know that he wants to forgive you, then right now, 
It says, as many as receive Jesus, to them he gives the right to be the sons of God. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Would you call on him now while the others are praying for you? We give you this minute to give you an opportunity while you're thinking about it. Right where you are, whisper out these words ever so softly. He can hear your whisper. He can read your heart. Say, Dear Father, I believe in Jesus best I can. Father, I ask you, please forgive my sins, all of them. I open my heart door. I ask Jesus, please come into my heart and live. Thank you, dear Jesus. Thank you, Father. Heavenly Father, I pray if for anybody who did receive you today, help them to grow strong in the Lord and the power of your might. They're, they're embarking on a new life. Help them, Lord. Uh, dear Christian friends, as we still have our heads bowed, if you would like to rededicate yourself to the Lord today, then right where you are, in your heart, you can just say this prayer. Dear Jesus, I thank you for my salvation. I thank you for the truths that you give us in the Bible. Lord, I'm struggling to grow strong in the faith. God, I ask you, please, the truth will set me free. Please, Lord, help me with this truth. I've been deceived by Satan. I want to offer myself to you as a living sacrifice. Please, Lord, help me. I need you. I need your love. I need your strength. Please, Lord, help me. I know you will. Strengthen me. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the time we had together today, Lord. We're going to partake of the Lord's table to remember your work on the cross, dear Lord Jesus. So we thank you for everyone who's come and pray a blessing on each and every one. In Jesus' name, amen. Friends, we'll have the benediction a bit later. Uh, we're going to have the Lord's table now. Uh, the Lord's table, if our men would come and move the table back here for me. Uh, the Lord's table may be new for some of you. You, you may not have uh, understood much about it before, but uh, it was um, a way that Jesus gave every generation uh, to remember his life, his work on the cross. Um, it, was the, it was a Thursday evening. It was the last night of his life. And Jesus Christ was spent 33 and a half years living among us, going through all the problems we have, and never once sinned, and never once did anything wrong. He was God living in a human body. He never had a human father. Through a miracle, God took his seed and put it with the woman's seed, and Jesus Christ was perfect. God in a human body. And he lived among us to show us what God is like, how God is full of love and kindness and gentleness and goodness, the fruit of the Holy Spirit, we studied it a while back, a couple of weeks, a couple of months, a month ago. And so this Jesus gave us a, a practical memory of him. We call it the Lord's table. He himself gave us this. And what it, what it amounts to was the Thursday evening, he was going to die on Friday. We're going to be put on the cross on Friday. And he knew that. And so he met with his disciples in the upper room and uh, they had dinner together, and then they were ready for dessert. They pushed back from the table a little bit, and Jesus told them, what's going to happen? I, I'm, going to be, I'm going to die on the cross. And they were very sad. He said, I'm going to give you something to remember me. And he gave them the Lord's table. It consisted of the bread they were eating, which was unleavened bread. It was like a cracker, no yeast to, to raise high. And then uh, he said, this represents this broken bread represents my body, which is going to be broken for you tomorrow. And then he passed the drink around and he said, this is to remind you of my blood. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness for sins. So Jesus went and shed his holy blood so that our sins could be forgiven, washed in the blood of Christ. That's why we sing about the blood. Modern churches sometimes take all the word blood out of their songs and everything else. Don't be ashamed of the word uh, blood, because it's, it's, it's very important in the Bible. The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. So the drink that they had represented the blood of Jesus Christ. 
It didn't literally become the blood. The cracker didn't become the body of Christ. It just represented that. It's like if I hold up a picture of my mother and I say, this is my mother. Well, you understand it represents my mother. It's not really my mother. It's just a picture of her. This, what we're doing today, is just a picture. You're having a little sermon, really. You're looking back to remember what Jesus did, and you keep doing it till he comes. So you're looking forward to his coming. So you're saying to people, I'm a Christian. So uh, what happened was uh, the Apostle Paul uh, initiated in the churches. In 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 12, oh no, wait a minute, that's, uh, uh, I've got the wrong chapter there. Uh, 1 Corinthians 11, yeah, 11, yeah, sorry, verse 23. Uh, I have received of the Lord, uh, this is Jesus, uh, Paul saying of Jesus, I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. Uh, I'll ask our men to stand, uh, come with me here. Uh, this uh, bread that we have is uh, the same kind of bread that they had uh, when uh, Christ was um, offering it to them. Uh, we're going to have a prayer, and then um, the men will bring this bread before you, and uh, just take a piece and hold it in your hand for a few moments, and then we'll all partake of it together. Uh, so let me have a prayer, and then uh, we'll pass out the, uh, the bread. Heavenly Father, we thank you very much for the remembrance that you gave us. Lord, it is special time for us to place ourselves beneath the cross of Jesus, to look up into your wonderful face, to see the agony of the cross, the pain that you were physically bearing, and knowing that it was for us that you did this. Your love kept you on that cross. Thank you for that, Lord. We take this bread now as a memory of what you did so many years ago, 2,021 years ago for us. It causes us to love you, Lord, to offer ourselves to you as you did for us. Bless each one now, Lord, as we partake. In Jesus' name, amen. Friends, I would ask you as the men pass out this, uh, uh, take this quiet few moments to confess any sins in your heart to the Lord. Just tell the Lord um, that uh, you confessed any sins you've done because Jesus said if you partake of this without confessing your sins, he says um, you're bringing judgment to yourself. So just quietly in your heart say, Jesus, I'm sorry for the sins I've done. Uh, please forgive me. And he will forgive you, and um, it'll be no judgment upon you at all. Uh, so just picture yourself standing beneath the cross of Christ. It's a good exercise. Uh, you see him there hanging uh, with the crown of thorns on his head, uh, the two thieves uh, on either side, uh, uh, everybody mocking him. But in your heart as you stand there, you have love for him. You have thankfulness to him because you understand what he's doing. So use this moment to confess privately to him. Jesus said, take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. Each eat all of it. So he took the cup. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for the cup. The blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses us from all sin. 
Thank you for that promise, dear Father. We have sinned and we need cleansing. And thank you that you sent your Son. Thank you, Jesus, for bearing our sins in your body. Thank you for your love. It's so precious to us, and we take this now to remember what you've done. And it's a very practical way to participate in your sacrifice for us. Bless us now, Lord, as we do this. In Jesus' name, amen. Again, friends, we would ask you, please uh, retain the, uh, take the little cup and just keep it in your hand that we may all partake together. Continue to confess your sins to the Lord and fellowship with him in your heart and to thank him for his love. and forget, do not dwell on them. Jesus said, this cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Drink ye all of it. Dear Father, again, we thank you for your wonderful love. You so loved the world, you gave your only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Thank you, dear Father. Jesus, thank you for coming. Holy Spirit, thank you for being in our heart. Thank you for your word. Bless each one now, Lord. Help us to do as you have uh, has taught us today. We learn today, Lord Jesus, to present ourselves to you as living sacrifices. Please help us with that. We love you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, if you pass your cups over, the men will collect them and uh, throw them out for us. Uh, Buck had promised me that he was coming with some food. Has uh, anybody seen Buck? Is he, is he here? Buck, going once, going twice. I guess we're, we'll have to just eat cake, I suppose. We, we did get the cake, didn't we? we? We got the cake? Okay, we got coffee and tea? Okay, well, we, we'll have a, a thanks. Let's see, what should we do, guys? We'll, we'll stand and um, have a prayer. For, we'll thank you for the cake and ask a blessing on our birthday young lady. And uh, we will... Uh, have the benediction and then we'll go. So let's stand together, please. Heavenly Father, again, we thank you again for your wonderful love. Thank you, Lord, that we can celebrate birthdays. 
uh, years that we walk with you. It's what a joy, uh, Lord, to have this memory of times with Jesus and times together with your people, fellowshipping. Uh, bless uh, those that had birthdays. Uh, we remember Dorina today on this, her special day. Uh, Lord, just uh, uh, her part of a lovely family, her and her husband and a child, little Nutza, uh, just an example of how you love and work in a family. Just work in all of us, Lord, as you continue to do, and bless them, special on this, her day. So thank you for the uh, refreshments that you've given us and uh, for the fellowship opportunity time. And uh, please bless each and every one of us, Lord. Now give us this benediction as we leave later on from Ephesians 3. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church by Jesus Christ to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Thank you, dear friends. God bless you. Uh, the men will bring in.